Hi, my name is Mac McComas, and I'm the Senior Program Manager at Johns Hopkins 21st Century Cities Initiative, and a co-author with Matthew Kahn of the new book, Unlocking the Potential of Post-Industrial Cities. In the book, we look at economic and demographic trends in six post-industrial cities of Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis over the past 50 years, and explore ways that they could reverse these trends in the near future. We study investments made by people, places, businesses, and local government, and how these investments can help post-industrial cities make a comeback so that everyone can reach their full potential. Today, I'm honored to be joined by my co-author, Matthew Kahn, who is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Economics and Business at Johns Hopkins and Director of the University's 21st Century Cities Initiative. We're also joined by Ed Glazer. Uh, Ed Glazer is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. He has served as director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and director of the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. He has published dozens of papers on cities' economic growth, law, and economics, and is the author of the book Triumph of the City, How Our Greatest Invention Makes Us Richer, Smarter, Greener, Healthier, and Happier. Ed, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, so thank you for having me on. So you and Larry Summers and Ben Austin wrote a great Brookings paper a few years ago about place-based policies. Can you remind us some of the key ideas in your paper and what lessons there might be for our Rust Belt cities like Baltimore, Cleveland, and Detroit? So I think it's worthwhile starting why economists like both you and me have often been somewhat allergic to place-based policies. And there are a number of reasons for that, right? I mean, we, we're not crazy about the idea of bribing people to locate in areas that are underperforming economically. We worry that subsidies to place end up benefiting the owners of land, not the employed uh, workers themselves, and certainly not the renters who end up seeing their, their rental payments go up. Um, we worry a lot about the possibility for boondoggles like Detroit's people, people move from monorail that are justified with the magic of place uh, rather than being put through a rigorous cost benefit analysis. Um, and those, those reasons made us, I think, understandably fearful of going down the place-based uh, route. Uh, I think on top of that, we were fairly confident that America's poorer places were catching up with the richer areas, which had been true for much of the last 140 years, mm -hmm. and that there was a migration channel that allowed people to, to get out of underperforming areas. Now, for several reasons, we've come to be at least slightly more open to place-based policies. And of a narrow form, not of an open, any white elephant will do. But the first is the changing nature of America's economic dysfunction. So 50 years ago, we worried primarily about poverty. I believe today that America's largest unsolved social problem is mass long-term joblessness. So just to take a particular demographic group, 25 to 55 year old uh, males, who the census calls prime age, which is something I'm sure you will agree with me, Matt, is a highly offensive uh, definition. Um, there were about one in 20 of them were jobless in 1967 when I was born. Uh, for much of the last 10 years, uh, more than 15% of prime age men have been jobless. Um, and that, of course, is not uh, a, you know, a uniform spatial feature. It's very much concentrated in America's eastern heartland, uh, this swath of territory that starts up in Louisiana and Mississippi and then runs up through Appalachia and the Rust Belt uh, cities of the, of the Midwest. Um, joblessness is different than poverty because we know how to handle poverty as economists, right? We just give people money, right? And you should give money to poor people, not poor places, right? Or at least I've made that argument, certainly. But if the problem is you're trying to get people employed, you, you, that's employers are located somewhere in place, or at least they've traditionally been. And so if you're going to have in, strategies that particularly induce people to, to create jobs, that then naturally becomes more, more spatial. Second thing that's changed is the growing geographic sclerosis of the United States. So migration has dropped dramatically. It's no longer directed, meaning poor people no longer move to particularly rich places. Um, about one third in terms of the annual migration rates, at least according to the work of, of uh, Raven uh, Malloy and, and her co-authors. Um, we see very little evidence of, of catch up anymore. So regional convergence, the fact that poor places have their incomes grow, grow more quickly than uh, uh, rich places, that phenomenon ended about 1990, which is just when Robert Barrow and Xavier Sally Martin really identified it. Um, and joblessness is highly persistent across place. 
So if you look at the places that had high joblessness in 1980, they are still the places that have high joblessness today. And when you do see migration out of these places, it's the most educated people who are most likely to leave. And so the people who are left behind in some sense are left without the human capital that is so often the bedrock uh, of local, regional and, and national success. So for those reasons, I think we need to be more open, but we need to be smart about it. And I think those, that means we need to focus on policies that actually are likely to generate jobs rather than policies that are just going to weave the magic of, of a Detroit comeback. And picking up on that point, our mentor and friend John King wrote at length about spatial mismatch. When you think about cities such as Baltimore, with its location on the Amtrak corridor, what, in terms of specifics on transport investment, can we hear your thoughts on, on how to pay and, and how to evaluate investments connecting Baltimore to Philly and DC and within Baltimore investments you and I have written about buses versus subways. Your current thoughts about place-based transport investment within cities and across cities in the local system of cities. You know, as you and I both know, there's an old joke that 40 years of transportation economics at Harvard can be boiled down to four words, bus good, train bad. And most of the time that is still true. And if we were talking about connecting Detroit with Chicago better, I would be very keen to talk about, well, can we do stuff with autonomous buses on dedicated lanes that get up to 120 miles an hour or 150 miles an hour? Baltimore is special because it is at the absolute heart of the most successful corridor for passenger rail in the U.S. And if there is a part of the U.S. in which you, we think it is valuable to invest more in, Baltimore has got to be the best case scenario. Another way of saying it is if we can't make the numbers work for Baltimore, they won't work anywhere else. So we, we do need to be, be rigorous about, about that. So I have not uh, spent a lot of time you know, going through the, the Amtrak improvement numbers. My colleagues like uh, Tony gomez Ibanez, who has, was, does seem fairly convinced that there are marginal things that can be done around the Asilas that are worth a bit of investing. Um, probably all south of New York, I'm sad to say, it's very hard to get the Boston to, uh, to New York numbers to, to add up. But sure, uh, I think it's worthwhile while, you know, trying to see if you can make that happen. But we need to be realistic about the economic effects of that. I mean, the best way to justify transportation investments is if the users can pay for them, right? So to the extent to which the, the users are willing to pay more to pay for the extra infrastructure are being added, then that seems like a no-brainer. To the extent to which we think that an improved Amtrak is going to reduce joblessness in Baltimore and it's going to pay for itself through this indirect fiscal employment channel, well, maybe, but you, you and I both know we'd want to be awfully careful about that. And I'd like to see some randomized controlled trials with, let's say, extra you know, extra Amtrak vouchers for someone to see whether or not we actually get any bang for our buck on this. So this would be an area in which I'd want to see more research before I was willing to justify many billions of dollars on an employment channel. And as the Biden administration, so as you know, the federal administration has always had large subsidies for big ticket items. Did you and Larry Summers debate this issue of, of the new merits of subsidies for, for city transit programs or, or the old logic from urban economics holds up well? So uh, my, my good friend Larry Summers has always been more enthusiastic about subsidizing infrastructure than I have. Uh, that is certainly true. Um, we took a, a clear view that we sort of wanted to push directly on employment, which meant using things like an earned income tax credit that directly subsidizes uh, job creation in high joblessness areas. We wanted to think about reforming policies like disability insurance that reduced the, the, the bite on, on working wages. Uh, and we were even open to sort of, uh, you know, things like large cuts in the payroll tax that uh, firms contribute for, for lower wage workers. And to get maximum bang for the buck, doing this in areas which had high levels of perpetual joblessness, because we thought that we had enough evidence to believe that the jobs created per dollar spent was gonna be higher in those areas than in places like Seattle, Washington that have relatively low levels of, of joblessness. Um, so we didn't end up really debating the infrastructure subsidy. I would say I have very little problem with the idea of modest subsidies for transportation that goes disproportionately to the poor, meaning buses, right? I'm not going to agonize very much about, you know, a few million dollars a year going to make sure that lower income people in, in Baltimore have the ability to get around without a car for every adult. Um, rail 
adds up. Uh, rail can get very expensive very quickly. And so I think we really do want to be careful about asking ourselves, is this actually generating non-travel related benefits that can offset those costs, especially since historically the people who ride Amtrak are not actually the poor. Uh, and and it, there is a question as to who exactly we're subsidizing with this. Let me pick up on that. At our 21st Century Cities Initiative Center, Mac and I have had discussions with scooter advocates within Baltimore. Do we have the right entry rules in our Uber economy of letting new technologies like scooters compete? Uh, do, have you had any thoughts on barriers to entry? Given your past work on political economy, are there interesting issues? Should there just be free entry of these technologies for us to see how they compete in, 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 in increasing mobility within cities? Uh, I think it's there are there are safety regulations that I, I'm really okay with. So just to be clear, I am generally on the side of allowing fewer barriers to entry almost every in almost every way. I do think that some forms of mobility can kill people, and so some degree of oversight over technologies that kill people is appropriate. Uh, I don't uh, I don't know about scooters. There is also an issue about are you just going to use scooters on pre-existing bike lanes? Are you going to have them on uh, currently pedestrian spaces? I think that needs to be thought out, and that is part of the area about you know all forms of transportation is generally you've got to manage the commons. And streets and sidewalks are the commons, and you want to think about your rules uh, about that. But generally, you know, I, I read, as I'm sure you did, Manker Olson, Rise and Decline of Nations in, in graduate school. And I remember being sort of underwhelmed when I read it. It sort of didn't real, feel right to me at all that, like, there are these insiders and these outsiders, and the insiders take over everything. Forty years later, I think he's completely right. I think what, 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 uh, 35 years later, I think basically America has been increasingly taken over by insiders who have made it difficult for outsiders to find something, find, find their future. And whether or not that is homeowners who make it difficult to build, existing incumbents in the restaurant business who make it difficult for food trucks to open, or a federal government that has been not unfairly described as a pension system with an army, right? For those reasons, I think I think we, we really are in danger of not making things easy enough, not making our cities places of hope for outsiders who come with less. So that's a great pivot. To Matt, can I bring you in to begin our discussion about urban entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I think it's it's no secret that um, there's been little job growth in, in cities such as Baltimore, Detroit, and Cleveland um, in, in recent decades. And, and what job growth there has been, it's been from large businesses, usually healthcare uh, institutions, hospitals. Um, uh, at the same time, cities, uh, some of the cities we look at, like Baltimore, have one of the highest rates of uh, Black-owned businesses of any city in the U.S. So. Um, again, if, if you're looking uh, for, for solutions to, to both increase jobs and um, uh, help alleviate urban poverty, uh, one would think that investing in, in better entrepreneurial environments that, um, that increase uh, small business job growth uh, is good. So in cities, I, I see everything from like startups and accelerators and technical assistance programs and CDFIs, and, and there seem to be a, a, a lot of, of um, activity in this space, but it's it's hard to know what works and 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 what cities really can do to generate better small business growth and, and entrepreneurial environments. Um, so I'd love to get your your insights there. It's it's I think we're we're, we're you know uh, I think we have, have a similar vision on this. Um, two facts. First of all, your healthcare fact. I remember when I was first looking at data on population growth across cities in the 1990s, and one of the facts that really duck out was the extent to which share of employment in the healthcare was a strong negative predictor of urban of urban success, right? Big negative at the local level. Not, I think, because medica, medical uh, employment was actually hurting these cities, but because it's what that's evidence of is that everything else is left. That like when everything else leaves the city, what you have left is big hospitals paid for by, by uh, you know, federal aid. And so, you know, that that predicts that's that's the hallmark of a, of a city that, that really has lost its entrepreneurial mojo. Second point, uh, right, is this idea that local entrepreneurship is incredibly important for success. I, I think there's a lot of evidence to back this up. Going back to uh, Ben Chinitz, who in the 1950s was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and noting that New York was more resilient than Pittsburgh was even then. And he, of course, this argued, argued that this was a, a legacy 
of New York's industrial heritage, where the garment industry was an industry with very few barriers to entry, uh, very few weak economies of scale. And so it was a mother of entrepreneurship. And the great thing about entrepreneurial human capital is you can get started making gloves and then you know, open your movie studio, right? Because you're good at looking for new opportunities. Um, it is amazing given how mediocre our measures of local entrepreneurial human capital are, that those measures are so predictive of subsequent growth. You know, Whether or not you're looking at average establishment size or share of employment in startups, both very powerful predictors of which cities have managed to reinvent themselves. And so I think trying to, to you know, improve the entrepreneurial environment feels to me like one of the most important things to do in Baltimore, Detroit, and Boston for that matter. Um, Partially because even in Boston, it is an, a deep irony in this in that we regulate the entrepreneurship of the rich so much more lightly than we regulate the entrepreneurship of the poor. If you want to, you know, start your internet phenom with your in your Harvard College dorm, there is basically no regulatory oversight over you until you've perhaps you know hacked an election. That's of course a fictional example, right? <laughs> if you want to start a, a grocery store that sells milk products uh, six blocks away, you have to get 15 permits to go through. And so because the less uh, well-educated tend to be more rooted in physical space as opposed to cyberspace, they are more afflicted with the rules that cities have imposed occasionally with some kind of public health benefit, but mostly, you know, it's hard to imagine what, what is the massive public health benefit associated with licensing for interior decorators, right? Well, that's, that's hardly a, uh, now, what do we? What can we do about it? I, I like one-stop permitting. I mean, this is the Devons Enterprise Commission. I like it partially because you can hold the permitting authority accountable, and you can have specialized human capital that says, "Look, you may have an immigrant community where you want people who know how to speak a different language other than English. You may want to have people who have cultural ties. Probably, you do want to wrap that together with some kind of a maker space, incubator kind of area, just to create a, a physical focal point." And then I like the idea of targeted vocational training. And this, this relates to sort of, you know, the underperformance in general of our urban school districts. I, I have lost a lot of, I, I am not very optimistic at this point in time, after having lived through, you know, 20 plus years of education reform efforts in America, of us fixing public schools, particularly in, in uh, dense urban areas. But I can easily imagine competitively sourced vocational training that wraps around schools right? That's available to everyone. You're not taking yourself off the regular track. You're just taking it on. And, you know, we can competitively source it for many vocational train skills like, you know, uh, like programming. You can have, you know, you can test the kid upon graduation and have pure pay for performance, right? Similarly with being a, a plumber, being a carpenter, right? You know whether or not the kid has learned the skills and so you pay for performance and so you can, you can competitively source it. So I like those things, but it is also true that we're still guessing. And what we really need is a combination of innovation in this space, policy innovation, and serious evaluation of that innovation. Whenever possible, we randomize control trial it. If not, at least we have somewhat rigorous uh, attempts to sort of figure out whether or not this, this thing is working. Because we need to start by understanding that we don't know what, what works. But it is a pretty good bet that having fewer, fewer barriers, fewer regulatory barriers, can't be harmful <laughs> in terms of opening stuff. And let me pick up on that. In, in our book, we discussed the paucity of Republican mayors in our six cities. Um, is, it, is it an exaggeration? If these cities were to elect some Republican mayors, would these men and women be more entrepreneur friendly and experiment more? Or is that naive of me? What's limiting the exploration of policies that might work? Look, I, I tend not to put a lot of weight on party labels at the local level. So, um, you know, I mean, we know from the work of Ferrero and Jerko that, you know, you compare Democratic mayors elected with 51 percent, Republican mayors elected with 51 percent, they kind of do the same thing, uh, which is very different, of course, than Republican versus Democrats at the, the state level or certainly at the federal level, where you've got to believe that the Biden administration is going to do things that are different than what the Trump administration would have done. But as the old line goes, there's no Democratic or Republican way to pick up the trash or to clear the snow. And so it, city mayors tend to be focused on pragmatic details. Now, um, that doesn't mean that I, I, I'm not friendly to what you're saying in the sense that I think cities would benefit by more political competition. I think that is certainly true. And cities need to recognize that, you know, uh, they need to create a, an economic environment in which it's possible to create jobs. And that's not, look, I mean, Baltimore can't be confused about this. New York apparently is, right? I mean, it, it's a, it's a, and this is a moment of, maximum vulnerability for cities. I believe very strongly that in this post-COVID world, right, that face-to-face -face combat 
contact will come back with a roar, that the world is filled with millions and billions of young people who are desperate to be living life in the real world again with their friends, with their, with their you know, co-workers and to get back. But that doesn't mean they necessarily need to do the same things they were doing beforehand, right? The, the startup that was in Silicon Valley in 2019 may decide to relocate en masse to Vail because they've got a lot of people who like skiing. They may decide to relocate to Austin because they want you know, uh, better barbecue and, and lower prices. They can do that. And I think even if you imagine a world that is still full of people working together in offices, people coming out to cities, no older, colder city has a lock on its businesses anymore. And so we're gonna need to compete. Uh, cities are gonna need to compete and a good business environment is really part of that. And I don't know how many election cycles it's gonna take for cities to realize that, but this is not the time to decide that you can treat your businesses like a piggy bank to be squeezed for whatever other objectives you have. This is a time to make it as easy as possible to start a business, especially if you're coming from a poor neighborhood and as easy as possible to grow that business. So to pick up on that, Ed, uh, you and Albert Saez and Jed Coco did pioneering work on the consumer city. So uh, a vibrant city can either be a very productive place and or a great place to live. What are some lessons from your work on consumer city and the literature that you created for our six cities? Uh, what can they lean into uh, in, in, in a Baltimore, in a Cleveland, in a Detroit to promote their consumer city and to make it more vibrant? So I think fundamentally, it's about attracting and training smart people and getting out of their way. That is the fundamental lesson for local economic development, right? Attract and train smart people. And that's what the consumer city is fundamentally about. The quality of life is not separate from economic development, right? That you need to make your place attractive for people who have entrepreneurial skills, who have technological skills. You need to make it attractive for them to come. Now, Baltimore has many, you know, it has a, has a gorgeous inner harbor, it has proximity to DC, it has lots of, lots of nice things, um, it has great museums, um, but there also are, are disamenities that are important. Now, what have we learned from this literature about which amenities are more or less uh, important? It's a little bit hard because you don't really have randomization at the local level. We know there are correlates with a lot of things, be it restaurants per capita or tourist nights and subsequent growth. We can't say exactly what it is that we would, we would vary. I, I will say it depends a little bit on what type of human capital you're focused on. So, uh, you know, when my friend Richard Florida talks about this, I often think he's thinking about sort of young hipsters and he has in mind things like creative cafes. He may well be right. I tend to think about, you know, a 37-year-old uh, mom who's working in a lab in the research triangle that we want to uh, attract to Boston. That argues for safe streets and good schools and a, and a reasonably fast commute. It all depends partially on which segment of the population you're trying to get. Uh, in, in the city of Baltimore, per se, uh, my guess is that the young hipsters may be easier uh, than, the, than the parents, but uh, it, it, you know, it, it has to really be done on a case-by-case -case basis but skills and quality of life uh, really go together. And you wanna be, be thinking about how to make the city more fun. Obviously, you know, the permitting agenda is not just about entrepreneurship, it's about uh, making the city more fun. And so these things really are wrapped, uh, wrapped together as one. And in some sense, when you think about the future of joblessness where we started, um, the one thing that, in at least until the COVID pandemic, was a safe haven for workers who were displaced by automation and uh, outsourcing was the urban face-to-face -face service economy, right? And so those types of jobs, which can make a city both fun and a, a place of opportunity are really the critical bedrock for Baltimore's future, I think. I think that's a key point. Mac, I want us to pivot to talk about a challenge for Baltimore and several of our cities, which is crime. Mac, can you tell Ed about ROCA, what ROCA is, what it intends, and I'd love to hear Ed's views on this as a way to help young people at risk to committing crimes. Yeah, so, so they're a, a program that actually started up in, in Boston, I believe, and, and had some early success there. Um, and, and what they do is they uh, uh, aggressively intervene with um, young adults who have been involved in, in some level of violence in the past and uh, sort of aggressively target them for, for services in terms of both counseling, mental health, but also job training and, and job placement. And what they're essentially saying is, we know you are the individuals um, who are highest risk of reoffending, um, and we're going to keep on going after you. 
And uh, if we're successful in, in just getting a couple of you, um, uh, you know, sort of out of uh, the world of violent crime and, and, and get some mental health treatment and um, hopefully some job placement, then, then we will have done our job well. Um, and so, there seems to be growing so, support for it. So, and as you see, this is a different type of profiling. Um, th this, um, it, 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 it's, this is a very costly program, but, uh, but, but it intends to help young people at risk, identify them through big data, and then targeting interventions to de-escalate what might be future issues. Has it been ICT'd? Does it make a difference? So it, it has not in, in Baltimore yet, um, although I know the, the first evaluation is, is underway. It, was the, was it, the Boston it, program subject to a randomized control trial? Was that? Uh... I, I don't believe so. And I view this as a cousin of Jens Ludwig's QJE on Be a Man. Um, have, 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 um, have you had views on, on that intervention or is, is the evidence mixed? Uh, no, I, look, I mean, I think clearly we need to be doing stuff like this. I just, I just want to make a plug that whenever you do, if you innovate and you don't also evaluate, ideally with a randomized control trial, it's like the innovation never happened. So I, I consider myself deeply friendly to this type of experiment because it attempts to, to reduce crime with less mass incarceration. I mean, we know the sort of broad arc of urban safety, right? In the night, as late as the late 1980s, it felt as if urban streets were no man's land that we couldn't control. Right? It felt as if the, the, the city was lost. Over the next 20 years, cities became miraculously, amazingly safe. Right? And all of a sudden, right, you could walk around areas of particularly the, the sort of richer cities in, in the US. Um, you know, New York became a poster child for safety. Boston became much safer. San Francisco became much safer. Even Chicago, Baltimore, uh, Detroit had, had improvements in, in safety. Um, less so, but we did it in a very tough way in many places. We did it with mass incarceration, uh, and we also we often did it with very brutal policing tactics like stop and frisk. Right? It has always, I think, been clear to any thoughtful observer of this process that that is, you know, uh, a half won victory at most, right? That a, that a victory that involves locking up millions of young men is not really a victory at all. That it, it's, it, did, it is very important that our city's streets remain safe, but it is absolutely critical that we continue to push on ways in which we can get our cities safe without locking everyone up. And to the extent to which ROCA can enable that to happen, it's absolutely the sort of thing that we should be experimenting with. And let me follow up there. Um, Mac, Ed did some very important work on the economics of riots. And in 2015, there was, Freddie Gray died in police custody in Baltimore, and there was a subsequent riot. And the murder rate in Baltimore has remained high after that. In your work on the economics of urban riots, do, have we seen this persistent effect or, or, or things eventually mean revert to where we were? Uh, is the Baltimore case an anomaly, an anomaly that we're at a new high murder rate that has persisted? So uh, I, I'm not going to, to, you know, I'm not going to take a stand one way or the other, but, but anyone who is watching this should at least take a look at the work by Tanaya Devi and Roland Fryer on uh, crime increases after uh, investigations of police shooting incidents. And what they find, and it's a small number of cities, it's five or six, but Baltimore is one of them, that uh, it's, a, and they put together a fairly compelling set of data that after these, uh, the federal investigations of the local police departments, the cops basically shut down. They stop visiting uh, high crime areas because they are, I don't know, afraid of being uh, arrested for something, afraid of being charged with something. Um, that's Debbie and Fryer's paper, and your, your viewers should read it themselves and make up their own opinion. But it is absolutely vital that we recognize that policing has a dual mandate, right? Policing has one mandate, which is to treat everyone with respect and to not brutalize their own population, but it also must stop crime, okay? And we cannot try and do, you know, just one of those two things. And it is not right to have a police force that ignores the, the community as it locks people up, but it is also not right for the police department to ignore the community in order to avoid any that forms of police brutality. And that's why I think sort of defund the police is just completely the wrong message. 
We want better police accountability. We want body cameras. We want incentives for police chiefs and for sergeants to make sure that their officers are being as polite, as decent, as kind in an inner city neighborhood as they would in the fanciest suburb. Okay, but we also need them to stop crime. Now, one thing I believe very strongly we learned in graduate schools, I, I still do not believe there's such a thing as a free lunch. And if we want our police to both create safety and to treat people with respect, we're gonna have to pay more for that, not less. And while I think we should be open to non-armed uh, delivery of some service, non-police deliveries of some forms of service, which is what Tracy Mears of Yale Law School has, has authorized, has, has pushed for in the sort of defund the debate, I think we want to be clear about the need to evaluate that as that goes forward. And I think we also need to be careful about eliminating the nonviolent interactions between police and ordinary citizens, because it is those nonviolent interactions that enable police when they're good, when they're given the right leadership, when they're given the right incentives to actually build relationships with the community. It's how they learn how to be nice, right? And so you don't want to put the police in a, in a situation where their only experiences are ones in which they're dealing with people under a threat of violence. You want to give them a chance to work themselves more seamlessly into the fabric of the community. Agreed. And building on that point, have you seen he research? He says agree. He's going to, on, the, on the next recording, he's going to say, what a terrible bad disclosure. <laughs> no, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm learning as usual. And urban public sector unions, in the aftermath of the, the, the George Floyd incident, much discussion on blogs, about the, the, the challenges posed by urban public sector unions to experiment. And has there been good economics research there on in, in a world with fewer public sector rules on hiring and firing? Would we achieve more of the two goals you outlined? Well, uh, look, I'll tell you, after 20 years of being on the sidelines of education reform, uh, and I was, I was for 10 years, I was on the advisory panel of the Gates Foundation's domestic branch, which is education. And it was very clear as part of that, that bo both I and the people around me basically learned that there was no path to education reform that did not involve cooperation with unions. You were not going to steamroller them. And you're not going to steamroller the cops unions either. And as much as we think it is somewhat despicable that police contracts have, you know, things which say after six months, all of your past violent actions against citizens have been wiped off of your off of your record. I mean, uh, the, the unions are there and they're going to need to be brought on board. Now, I think the way to understand those things, uh, understand those protections for, for bad cops. And I want to also stress, I, I think that, you know, there are wonderful teachers out there and I think there are wonderful cops out there. I think there are many cops who are risking their lives, just as there are many teachers who are in very difficult circumstances. But there are bad cops, as we know, as we saw in that awful video of George Floyd's uh, killing. Um, we need to make sure that um, we don't have a system that protects them. Now, what happens is, in these union negotiations, it's exactly the same thing that happens with pensions, is that city officials trying to cut costs decide to pay with benefits where the costs are invisible, where the costs are shrouded, rather than to pay with money. And that's exactly how these things work out, right? The, the union would have been perfectly happy to take another buck an hour instead of something that protects their, their people, but the government wasn't willing to do, them, do that, so they paid them off with this thing, okay? It's exactly the same thing which leads to the nonsense of our having so much of our public compensation in the form of, of subsequent pensions, right? The work of uh, Maria Fitzgerald shows clearly that young teachers in Illinois do not value their pension promises at more than, you know, 15 cents on the dollar. And yet this is how they're compensated. They're compensated, I think, primarily because you can sell these pension promises to voters as being very low cost because you claim that you're going to get 10% a year in terms of your pension returns, which is, of course, also nonsense. And that's why so many communities face these public, face, face these uh, pension overhangs. So do I think there is something fundamentally unhealthy about um, unions bargaining with political officials who they themselves play a major role in electing? I think that is a worrisome thing. It's not my favorite thing, but it is part of American democracy. Uh, and it, it's fundamentally different. It's part of the issue with public sector unions versus private sector unions is there's a clearly demarked management versus, uh, versus union thing in the private sector, whereas in the public sector, unions are very active politically. They have, have a First Amendment right to be so. Uh, and so um, it's, it means inevitably they have, they're, they're partially represented on both sides of the bargaining table. And I wish it were otherwise, but it is so. And we, we have to figure out ways in which, you know, we can make that work with, with the dual mandate of policing. And I suspect that means paying more 
rather than paying less and not trying to get it off on the cheap. The two last issues we wanted to talk to you about is a, a, a major theme in our book is four levels of investment. Um, young people investing in their skills, investing in infrastructure, investing in entrepreneurship, and investing in these cities' real estate. And uh, as we think about our teacher, Jim Heckman's work on investment in the very young, for poor cities like ours, do you support state and federal subsidies for these programs of how should financing be, how should finances be done to, uh, to invest optimally in young people such that they achieve their full potential? So, you know, there's not a lot of federal subsidies of cities that I'm enthusiastic about, but I am certainly highly enthusiastic of a federal role in taking care of the youngest Americans. I, I think that is entirely right, right? Any redistribution you think that should be going on in this country should be done at the federal level. If we expect our cities and towns to be, you know, engines for redistribution, uh, when you try and run a local safety net, the rich just leave, right? You can't do this. Whatever redistribution should occur needs to happen at the national level. Now, education isn't quite redistribution, but it's awfully close, right? I mean, the primary reason we want to invest in poor kids is so that they end up being richer adults. And it is a shocking fact about our cities that whereas they are uh, escalators of opportunity for adults who come there, the people who come to cities and see faster wage growth year by year, month by month, they appear to be really troubled places for providing opportunity for the young. Uh, this has come up in sort of all of Raj's data, Raj Chetty's data, my colleague Raj's Chetty da data on uh, upward mobility, uh, you know, there's a huge discontinuity at the edge of the central city school district. The denser your neighborhood, the, the worse off you do as an adult. And this again is typically looking at kids who are born to parents at the 25th percentile and at right at the quarter, uh, and then asking how well they, they do as adults. Um, people who live closer to the central city do poorly. So really our cities are, are failing their poorer kids. And it is a national travesty uh, that, this is, that this is happening. Um, we don't know entirely how to fix it. Uh, we do have some clues. I mean, in some sense, the life of the urban poor is much more segregated than the life of, oh, sorry, the life of the life of poor children is often much more segregated than the life of poor adults. So if you are a, you know, an immigrant working parent in a Boston neighborhood, you are likely to be going to work in an office building that is filled with high human capital people, that's filled with like opportunities and various things. If you're a kid, you may be living in a housing project and going to an almost segregated school. Right? And so it's a very different experience in terms of the mixing of the city. And so the ability of cities to, to be places where people are brought in together into a sort of connected uh, hive of human activity is broken in many of these poorer neighborhoods. Um, now, I think we need to invest more. Uh, America is always gonna be more comfortable investing in children than they will be in large scale redistribution for adults. And I certainly understand that. And so I think that you know, a large scale uh, federal attempt to try and figure out how to make our, our kids' lives better through aggressive education interventions makes perfect sense. But, and here's the one caveat, we actually are not sure what works yet. And so what we need to start doing is you know, intervening, intervening in ways that involve randomization and then start scaling things up. That doesn't mean that we need to like do small amounts of people or small amounts of money. We could do massive numbers of these things in massive in different places, right? We could just evaluate different ones. You could randomize people into these programs and so you could figure out what works. This can be a large scale intervention, but it has to be start with the humility to learn. It has to start with the recognition that we are not sure what works in this area. And that is, uh, I think the absolutely central thing. On that point, where do you now stand on move to opportunity of, uh, of how that fits into this agenda of experimentation. Are you ready to scale up that program to reduce urban poverty in our cities? I'm certainly fine for scaling up uh, Section 8 housing vouchers. I'm certainly fine on doing more to make sure the people who get Section 8 housing vouchers, uh, particularly parents with young children, move into better neighborhoods. I'm certainly fine. I'm enthusiastic about doing more to target Section 8 housing vouchers to parents with small children. That feels like that's a no-brainer given, given the findings on MTO. So uh, yeah, modest scaling up. I tend not to think that, you know, America's ever gonna accept, uh, uh, you know, a, a sort of moon uh, moonshot kind of level spending for Section 8 housing vouchers. And I think even more so, I guess I fundamentally believe more in education 
than I do in moving people around. But uh, I think expanding the program by 50% and doing more to target it towards parents with young kids and doing more to push people into, into neighborhoods that seem to be good for kids, I'm all for that. Matt, can I bring you in to ask our final two questions? I've been hogging the mic to, to learn from this young man. Sure. So, so in our book, we, we conclude by revisiting um, Paul Krugman's history uh, and expectations um, and thinking about how people choose to or not to um, invest in, in uh, any of one of the four areas that, that Matt outlined. Um, and, and, you know, as, as we think about uh, the, the future of our, of our post-industrial cities, and we, we've talked about um, sort of post-COVID, how they might be able to compete a little bit better, but um, obviously, you know, expectations of, of, um, of, of people in, in Baltimore and Cleveland to Detroit matter a lot. So if, if people think that Baltimore is, is continually going to have over 300 murders a year, uh, they're likely not to see a, a whole lot of population growth. Um, so how, how do you see this, this play out, um, you know, sort of uh, thinking about the future of these cities? There's no question that there are coordination aspects of cities, but uh, I, I think the main thing to do, I mean, you've given a real example, which is murders. Uh, the main thing to do is not to worry so much about expectations, but to worry about getting the murders down. Right. I mean, you, you want to just figure out whatever, whatever it takes to provide safety plus respect for the community. And you want to make that happen. Um, and uh, cities are pretty good at publicizing themselves. Detroit's all, I mean, I think I've been reading stories about Detroit's comeback for 35 years. Uh, the, um, so I, I don't think that, that's, that that becomes a, a difficult thing. Um, and I would just start with a very clear quality of life, things that are the job of city government. And I think that's the, that's the first place to start rather than um, to worry too much about the, the, how much is determined by history and how much is shaped by, by expectations. There's no question that the physical landscape is very historical. I mean, all of our cities fall under this. It's not that clear what that implies then for public policy. It's just you're stuck with it. I mean, you've got you've got these historical bones, and they're uh, they could be either good or bad. And you know, you've got you've got an amazing port in uh, Baltimore, which is good and and bad. And you've got rivers around uh, Manhattan, which are both good and bad. And so uh, these are all features of the watery origins of our of our cities. Um, but I, I don't, and and they matter. Uh, in a big way, but it's not clear that there's that there's an action item under there. The action item is let's get our city streets safer. And thank you very much. This was great. Thanks. Thank you, Matt.